Thanks all you love birds for joining us for our Valentine's Day themed webinar. I'm Jordan Rutter, Director of Public Relations at American Bird Conservancy. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel afterwards. We'll be putting the links referenced in the chat, but in case you miss them or don't copy them down fast enough, please know that everything can be found in a follow-up email we'll send out to registrants and on our website. So please submit any questions you have during the presentation using the Q&A box. We'll try to answer as many of those as we can at the end in the Q&A portion, but we also will be answering some questions live, so just keep an eye out. Automated captions are available for this webinar, and you can turn them on by clicking on the up arrow next to the CC icon and clicking on show subtitles. You can then drag them wherever you want on the screen. So before I begin uh, with the rest of the presentation, I wanted to share some background about American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC. This organization was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds across the Americas. And we continue that work today following a conservation strategy outlined by the pyramid featured on the current slide. Our work strives to keep common birds common and prevent the rare species from going extinct. So how does ABC and bird conservation relate to Valentine's Day and chocolate? Well, have you ever thought about how chocolate is made? The main ingredient is cacao, which is a plant that farmers grow. And like other crop land, birds live in and around these areas. Agricultural practices have a huge environmental impact, but there are ways to grow cacao that conserves and restores habitat for birds. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers. We have Emily Stone, who is the founder and CEO of Uncommon Cacao, a group of transparent trade cacao operations, including Maya Mountain Cacao, Cacao Verapaz, and Uncommon Cacao. Emily leads Uncommon Cacao's work importing delicious, high quality, transparently sourced cacao from over 14 countries, from over 200 craft and premium chocolate makers globally. Emily is an Ashoka Fellow, an Unreasonable Fellow, and recipient of the Fine Chocolate Industry Association's Recognition of Excellence, an Outstanding Contribution at Origin and Sustainability of Fine Chocolate. We also have Ruth Bennett joining us, who is a research ecologist at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute's Migratory Bird Center. She focuses on optimizing the conservation of birds and other wildlife and working landscapes, especially coffee and cacao growing regions of Latin America. She developed a love of migratory birds and coffee agriculture while serving as the Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras, where she found a population of overwintering female golden-winged warblers, which she studied for a master's degree in applied ecology at Michigan Technological University and a doctorate in applied ecology from Cornell University. Andres Anchando works to protect migratory birds in their wintering grounds in Latin America and the Caribbean. Before joining ABC, Andres worked with NRDC's Latin America project researching mechanisms to finance climate smart projects in the region. Previously, Andres worked with WRI's Global Restoration Initiative, researching business models to restore degraded lands and the financial barriers to scale faced in the restoration industry. Andres has a master's degree in agroforestry, a master's in enterprise development, and a bachelor's of arts degree in finance and he's originally from Chihuahua, Mexico. Emily is going to start things off now by sharing more about what cacao actually is and how it's produced. So Emily, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Jordan. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Wonderful. Great, so thank you so much to the American Bird Conservancy and to all of you, it is so great to be here. Um, I'm going to dive right in and share some more information about the cacao tree, cacao farming, and how cacao becomes chocolate. Um, so first, a little bit about my organization, Uncommon Cacao. Uh, we are a cocoa bean or cacao trader. Um, we started in 2010 as exporters of cacao from Belize in Central America and then uh, in Guatemala. And we then became importers of cacao in the US and Europe, uh, where we currently have offices. Um, we bring in cacao from more than 5,000 smallholder farmers now in more than 12 countries, and we distribute that cacao globally to over 250 chocolate makers globally. Um, this gives us some pretty interesting insights into both the cacao production side of the chocolate industry, as well as the chocolate manufacturing and chocolate sales aspects. Um, and you can see here listed some of the other partners that we work with uh, around the world. 
So I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of where cacao is actually produced and consumed. Um, the pink circles that you see on this map, uh, which come from, uh, this image comes from the Cocoa Barometer, which is a really important publication about the general state of the cocoa industry. It's put out every couple of years. Um, the pink circles on the map are related to the production of cacao and the brown circles are where it is consumed. Um, a couple of key things I wanted to point out here. Uh, you can see that Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, both in West Africa, are, are by far the largest producers of cacao globally. Um, however, cacao is actually endemic to Latin America, and there is still a very um, strong amount of cacao production happening in Latin America. Um, Ecuador and Brazil are the largest producers, um, and there's a fair amount of chocolate consumed in the Americas as well. Um, Brazil alone, for example, as you can see in the brown uh, circle there, consumes more chocolate than all of Africa combined, which is really interesting. Um, Europe is by far the largest consumer of cacao or chocolate at more than double the amount of the US, which might be surprising to some of the chocolate lovers in the US uh, on, uh, on the webinar today. And um, also interestingly, Asia has emerged recently as both a consumer and producer of cacao. Um, and it's definitely growing uh, as a chocolate market and as a producer. Um, Theobroma cacao is the scientific name of this amazing crop. Um, that name was given to it uh, in, in 1753 by Swedish botanist uh, Carl Linnaeus. Theobroma is Latin for food of the gods and cacao comes from the Nahuatl or Aztec language um, and means uh, bitter from the uh, chococ and uh, water from Atzel, so chocolate, uh, which came to cacao. Um, the cacao tree is a beautiful tree. You can see an example of it here. It's a little bit Susian in its appearance. Uh, the pods grow directly from the trunk, uh, so it's a cauliflory tree. Uh, coffee is actually another cauliflory tree, with similar performance. Um, cacao trees are typically managed at around 10 to 12 feet of height so that all pods can be easily harvested by the farmer. Um, but it can grow much taller than that. Cacao trees can grow to over 40 feet in height. Um, and it's a long-term crop. So the tree typically takes about three years before it starts producing fruit um, and really five years before a strong harvest. Um, but it's a long-term crop. The trees can, can definitely produce for more than 40 years under good management practices. Um, so it's, it's a good investment, but it is also hard to switch away from cacao once a farmer has started uh, to, to grow uh, this crop. A tree will typically give a farmer between 30 to 40 cacao pods per year. And something that is um, really special about cacao is that it actually grows best. It performs really well in agroforestry systems, um, which I'm sure we'll be covering later in the webinar today. Um, it's a mid canopy species. So it typically is shaded um, in agroforestry systems by timber and taller fruit trees. Um, and uh, crops can also grow under cacao. So chate, yucca, uh, and other valuable crops can grow underneath. Um, it can be part of a really healthy and biodiverse ecosystem. Um, bananas and plantains are also often used to provide initial shade for cacao trees as they're growing. Um, and importantly, this biodiversity uh, can create a really nice habitat for wildlife. And I know that's why we're all here today. Um, so cacao pods, as uh, you can see here, come in a really wide variety of colors. They're very beautiful. They're shaped a little bit like uh, Nerf footballs or American footballs, and they can have a lot of different textures um, as well. Inside of the fruit, once you crack it open, as you can see here, is a fluffy white flesh. Um, and inside that white flesh are seeds. Um, they're typically purple in, in color, ranging from like a lavender to a dark purple. And they're hard, they're flat, they're elliptical. Um, a cacao pod will typically have between 20 and 50 seeds uh, in a pod. Um, and those seeds are actually cocoa beans. So one really cool fact is that uh, chocolate comes from fruit and uh, cocoa beans themselves are the seeds of a fruit. Um, cacao has to be fermented and dried. So we can't uh, just you know, turn those that fruit itself into chocolate. Uh, cacao has to go through about a two week fermentation and drying process that uh, actually uh, the, the fruit will um, penetrate into the seeds um, as it goes through an anaerobic and aerobic fermentation process, uh, reducing the bitterness and astringency that's naturally found in the seeds and helping to create the flavor precursors for what we all know to be chocolate. 
Um, and also enabling the uh, seeds or beans to be at a humidity level or moisture content that enables them to be transported to other countries. Um, cacao farming is a lot of work and uh, it's the livelihood of over 5 million smallholder farming families globally. Um, around the world in more than 50 countries, cacao is produced by smallholder farming families. Um, cacao farmers are typically producing cacao on small plots of less than five hectares. And despite producing the raw material for one of the world's most beloved products, um, chocolate, uh, just chocolate, of course, um, approximately 80% of these uh, cacao producing families are still living on less than $3 a day, um, which is a big problem. Um, cocoa is a commodity and prices for cocoa have been really low for a long time, as you can see in this chart here. Um, when chocolate is cheap, uh, cocoa farmers tend to be paid low, lower prices, um, and there have been a number of forces causing downward pricing pressure on cocoa over recent decades. Um, growth in supply, as well as um, some of the uh, factors of the commodity market itself. Um, this is a big problem because if being a cocoa farmer doesn't produce uh, good outcomes or uh, a good livelihood for families, then the kids growing up in that family are likely to leave the farm, um, and our cocoa supply could be in danger. Um, not to mention that uh, cacao farmer poverty is a key driver of the labor and environmental issues that many of you may have heard of uh, in the chocolate industry. Um, these tend to get the most headlines, um, but we really need to address cacao farmer poverty in order to make progress on these really important big issues. Uh, the good news is that uh, consumers care about sustainability in their chocolate and we can see a path for a much brighter future uh, for this industry. In particular, consumers care about avoiding deforestation and being more environmentally sustainable in their chocolate. Um, this was from a consumer chocolate consumer report that came out uh, two years ago in 2019. Um, I thought this was really interesting because uh, the generation known endearingly as boomers actually care the most about avoiding deforestation overall. Um, but at least 50% of all chocolate consumers across all generations care about this issue. 74% um, of the buyers of fine chocolate or the type of single origin chocolate that our customers, the buyers of really high quality cacao tend to produce, um, care about this issue. And 51% of consumers overall are willing to pay more for chocolate that is sustainably sourced. Um, so this is really good news and anything that we all can do to help make sure farmers are incentivized to protect the environment and earn more money while doing it um, is going to really help steer the industry in the right direction. Uh, that said, I also wanted to just make a note that quality really matters. Um, it's important to note that at the end of the day, um, these, you know, cocoa beans or cacao becomes chocolate and it's an amazing and a delicious food. So for sustainability programs to deliver long-term commercial success for farmers and for chocolate makers, um, it's really important that the chocolate tastes good. Um, we know consumers will pick the bar up off the shelf if it has you know, the right certification and demonstrates alignment with sustainable sourcing, um, but for consumers to keep coming back to that bar and you know, buy it over and over again and share it with all their friends, uh, it's really important that the chocolate itself tastes really good. Um, so this is why we at Uncommon Cacao focus on both quality and flavor um, alongside the sustainable sourcing work that we do. Um, we wanna make sure that consumers who are making the right decisions are incentivized uh, to keep making them. And uh, that's it from me. Thank you so much for um, your uh, attention and I'm looking forward to the rest of this webinar. Thanks so much, Emily. So friendly reminder to our audience that we are recording this webinar. So don't worry if you couldn't copy down all of that great information. We'll be sending a follow-up registration email um, with, with all of this information. So we also encourage you to use the actual Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And this will help us better track and reply to your questions both during the presentations and at the end of the webinar. But we're now going to hear from Ruth about the agricultural aspects and what bird-friendly cacao actually means. Great, thanks very much, Jordan. Um, I hope everybody's seeing my screen here. Uh, I am Ruth Bennett, a research ecologist at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. 
Uh, first, happy Valentine's Day to everyone. I'm very excited to be here chatting with you about Bird Friendly Cocoa, our new initiative at Migratory Bird Center. So while I know we're all thinking about chocolate right now, I want to have you pause for just a moment uh, and think briefly about the biodiversity crisis on the planet. So researchers at our center and at the American Bird Conservancy have documented a decline of 3 billion birds in North America since the 1970s. Now, the vast majority of these birds are migratory, and many of them overwinter in the Caribbean, Central America, and South America in the landscapes where cocoa is farmed. That shocking news came at around the same time as reports of an insect apocalypse, widespread losses of insect diversity and abundance. And at its root, the biodiversity crisis is driven by changes in land use. In the panel that you're looking at at the bottom, everything that appears pink there was tropical forest in the year 2000 and over the past 20 years has been lost, primarily to the expansion and the intensification of commercial agriculture. Now in those tropical forests, one of the drivers of deforestation can be cocoa production, which is, as Emily mentioned, uh, the fundamental ingredient for chocolate. The image you're looking at here is taken from the Peruvian Amazon. This was 40,000 hectares of lowland Amazonian rainforest that was de deforested and converted to a chocolate plantation. And reports such as Mighty Earth Chocolate Dark Secret highlight how the cocoa industry can actually drive deforestation within national parks in West Africa. So these are really shocking reports. They often make headlines um, and it can be really frustrating and uh, difficult for a consumer to think about how do I eat chocolate, a product I love, when I know there can be this relationship with deforestation, loss of birds, loss of other biodiversity. But Cocoa is not fundamentally an evil crop. It does not need to be grown on land that was deforested. Um, cocoa can be grown in many different types of farming systems. So on the left here, you're looking at what would be called a full sun monoculture. These are cocoa trees that were planted on deforested land. There are essentially no other trees grown with them. And in many places of the world, this is how cocoa is now grown. However, traditionally, cocoa was grown more in systems like you see on the right here. This would be called an agroforestry system, where cocoa, as a small tree, is planted underneath the shade of larger trees. Uh, this can be mixed in with bananas, with citrus, with timber trees, and with retained trees from the original forest that existed on that land. And you don't need to be a biologist to know that the system on the right, the cocoa agroforest, is going to have more birds, more biodiversity, um, and be a better place to live and hang out than the system on the left, the full sun monoculture. So at the Smithsonian, uh, we're committed to understanding and promoting that type of system on the right, cocoa farming systems that provide value to birds and to the farmers that are working in them. Uh, we have this logo that we are just now launching for COCO, the Bird Friendly COCO Certification, uh, and our tagline is proudly serving biodiversity. We know that in many cases, birds actually serve as an indicator for the overall health of that ecosystem. And while our bird friendly certified farms have many more birds than a mon monoculture, they often have more insects, more herps, uh, more small mammals, and uh, are just generally more environmentally friendly farming systems. So up until this current year with the launch of Bird Friendly Cocoa, the Bird Friendly program has only worked in coffee. So you may have heard of, you may actually already purchase Bird Friendly Coffee and coffee is considered, or the Bird Friendly certification is considered the gold standard for biodiversity conservation in coffee farming systems. We currently certify um, about 17,000 hectares of coffee land globally, 20 million pounds of coffee uh, that's produced in 13 countries. And our certification in coffee means that coffee is grown under a diverse shade canopy. So many different species of primarily native shade trees and that it has organic production. We have over 20 years of research that shows that our criteria for the certification are better for birds than any other certification or any other farming system in coffee.
So we were really interested to expand our certification into COCO, but because Smithsonian is primarily a scientific organization, a research-based organization, we did not want to develop that standard without doing some research about what types of management actions are best for birds in cocoa farming systems. So I actually conducted uh, some research two years ago now, looking at all of the publications across the world from cocoa farming systems that analyzed how birds respond to cocoa farm management. So uh, we pulled data from all of the sites that you see here in blue, which widely cover the cocoa belt. And I really like this map because it also highlights how cocoa production, which you see in gray, broadly overlaps the biodiversity hotspots of the planet, which you see in green. So cocoa farming is not just important for birds, it's also important for many of the unique endemic resident tropical species found on the planet. So with all this data that we compiled, what did we find? Um, I'm gonna walk you through this graph. It looks kind of scary, but it's not. <laughs> um, before I show you the data, I just wanna show you what the graph is showing. So we're looking at four different types of cocoa farming systems here and comparing how bird diversity uh, compares in that cocoa farming system to adjacent native forest. So the system on the left is called rustic cocoa. This is where cocoa trees, these little guys here at the bottom, are planted underneath a canopy of native forest trees. Typically, it has at least 60% canopy cover, uh, and this we would assume is probably the best type of system for birds, but we didn't have evidence to say that. Um, cocoa is often commonly farmed in mixed shade systems where you have some native forest trees and also planted trees, citrus trees, um, nitrogen fixing trees, fruit trees. So we call that mixed shade, typically a little bit lower canopy cover, fewer tree species, and a mix of native and planted things. Then low shade cocoa is more like the system you saw earlier, uh, where you may have zero, one, or two different tree species planted with the cocoa, very low canopy cover. That's kind of the industry standard at this moment for how cocoa is produced in countries that are really trying to ramp up their yields and their cocoa production. And then at the end, we're comparing this to an annual monoculture, like corn, maize, sorghum, that's planted completely without shade trees. And on the, the data that we're going to be looking at here, anything above this dotted line says that the cocoa system is actually better for birds than forest. If it's around the dotted line, it's about equal in terms of bird diversity for, uh, compared with nearby forest. And if it's under the dotted line, it's going to be significantly worse for birds than forest. And the scale here is looking at the, the factor um, by which it's better. So something at five is about five times better for birds in terms of biodiversity than forest. So what did the data show us? In our rustic shade system and our mixed shade system, bird diversity is actually about equal to the diversity found in nearby adjacent forests. However, when we move into low shade systems, we get about a fourfold decline in bird diversity, and it's relatively equivalent to the decline found in an annual monoculture. So this is very strong evidence for us to say that rustic cocoa and mixed shade cocoa are the types of systems that we want to call bird friendly. Low shade cocoa is not. We also looked at what specific management actions a farm can take that will increase the value of the farm for birds, and we found overwhelming support for diversity and density of shade trees on the farm driving the bird diversity that was present on those farms. So these two systems on the left, many more shade trees, quite a bit denser, are going to have many more species of birds than these two systems on the right. But the landscape context around the cocoa farm is also very important. We found that forest patches and cocoa farms in landscapes that still have significant amounts of native forest both have better uh, diversity of birds and better species um, in terms of endemic species, species that are likely to go likely to be endangered than a landscape like the one you see on the right here, where the same type of cocoa farming system has lost some of those endangered and endemic species. So forest patches and highly forested landscapes are also critical to protecting the birds that we love, especially the endemic species and frugivores. Uh, in fact, those are often not found in cocoa farms. So with the study completed, all of the information compiled, 
uh, we created the bird friendly cocoa criteria for our certification. It focuses first on forest conservation because we know that's critical for bird diversity, especially for those endemic species. So our standard does promote farms that conserve 50% of their forest uh, and allows them to enter the certification. We then uh, focus on shade tree diversity and shade tree cover because at the farm level, those are the two things that are most important for birds. Uh, so we require that farms have at least 11 tr shade trees per hectare and at least 40% canopy cover. Um, those are typically the upper threshold of a productive cocoa system. So that's what we want to promote. And then we also uh, ask that farmers retain their riparian buffers. That's a great way to introduce other types of vegetation into the system uh, without deforesting all the way down to the edges of rivers. And then we require traceability from the farm level all the way to the point of sale. So we want to know that cocoa produced on a bird-friendly farm is the same cocoa that's in your bird-friendly chocolate bar. And in our literature review, we also found that what's best for birds is also best for the cocoa crop and for farmers. Having bird friendly certification or any sort of specialty certification allows farmers to access specialty markets uh, like Uncommon Cacao, where they're likely to get better prices. Cocoa longevity, how long the plant lives and produces for, is actually much better in agroforestry systems as well. They tend to be more climate resilient, so they better withstand extreme temperature events and extreme rainfall events. They also provide greater soil fertility and moisture, which is really important for the cocoa plants and anything else that's planted in those systems. They sequester much more carbon than a full sun monoculture. And when you have all of those shade trees and the birds living in them, the birds actually sometimes will help out the cocoa plant itself by eating insects that otherwise would damage the cocoa leaves or the cocoa pods. Uh, so there's a lot going on on these farms that's great for birds and is also good for the cocoa plant and the farmers. Now we often get asked how bird friendly compares to the other certifications that exist currently in cocoa. So uh, I created this little table just to walk you through it. So bird friendly, the Smithsonian bird friendly seal means that shade cover is strictly regulated on the farms. We don't allow any synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. This is pesticide free production. And we guarantee that all farms that are bird friendly certified provide habitat for a diverse community of birds and wildlife. We are the only certification that can make that claim. Rainforest Alliance is another very popular certification. It, it certifies a lot of cocoa production globally, but shade cover is optional under the Rainforest Alliance certification. Um, they do limit the pesticides that farmers can use, but they are not pesticide free. So Rainforest Alliance can claim that some of their farms provide habitat for birds and other wildlife, but not all of them. Fair trade is another very common certification but shade is not regulated. Pesticide regulation is optional, so there aren't really any regulations in place to help birds and other wildlife. USDA organic or other types of organic certification similarly do not regulate shade and therefore cannot guarantee that they are providing habitat for wildlife, but they do regulate pesticide and fertilizer use. And so we know that bio, there are biodiversity benefits that occur with organic certification, um, but no habitat requirements in place. And then finally, you may have heard the term shade grown, you may have seen products listed as shade grown, but that term is not a certification, it's not defined or regulated, and I've seen it applied to products that may have one shade tree per hectare, may not even have any shade trees because no one is inspecting what that term means. So if something is labeled shade grown, some of the farms may provide habitat for birds, but no guarantees in place. So what can you do? You can help us. Um, there's two easy ways uh, that you can support bird-friendly cocoa production. The first is to buy bird-friendly products. And the second is to share the story and become a bird-friendly ambassador. Where do you buy bird-friendly? So if you Google buy bird-friendly, you'll get taken to the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center bird-friendly website where we have a portal to buy bird-friendly products. We currently do not have any chocolate products listed on this site, but that is going to change very quickly. Um, so you can find all of our bird friendly coffee products that are available in the United States at this website. For cocoa, you should Google Zorzal Cacao. So we just finished uh, a pilot certifying farms that provide cocoa to Zorzal Cacao, a company in the Dominican Republic, and they have a number of chocolate products that are available for sale from those now 
bird friendly certified farms. Um, just to highlight really quickly, Zorzel Cacao uh, is located in the northern part of the Dominican Republic. 75% of their land they can serve in a forever wild reserve and then they cultivate cocoa in uh, the remaining 25% of the land to provide uh, revenue for the long term maintenance of this protected area that cocoa does meet our bird friendly standard. Uh, dandelion chocolate, um, hummingbird chocolate, Rika and Zoder all sell coffee or sorry chocolate products that are produced with this bird friendly certified cacao. So go ahead and Google any of those and you can have their chocolate bars sent straight to your door, which will make a great Valentine's Day treat. And then if you're interested to learn more, to help us share the story, to build more market, more, more demand, um, more interest in bird friendly, send me an email at birdfriendly at si.edu and we can send you a toolkit to help you become a bird friendly ambassador to help share the story, recruit your local chocolate shops to source bird friendly chocolate and to sell bird friendly. And you could host bird friendly events of your own to get more people excited about it. Um, so I really want to thank you all for uh, attending this webinar. I look forward to the next presentation and I'll be here to answer questions later. Thanks so much, Ruth. That was great. We're now going to hear from Andres at ABC about some current projects that our organization is doing in connection with Bird Friendly Cacao. Thank you, Ruth, and hi, everyone. Really um, happy to be here and sharing this space with Emily and Ruth, and especially having this opportunity to tell you how ABC um, works with cacao farmers in Latin America and the Caribbean to conserve our neotropical migratory birds. Um, I would like to start by um, getting us on the same page. So basic, basic term is what are neotropical migratory birds? Um, these are birds that migrate between North America and the tropics, and they fly from the tropics to North America um, every year as well. There are around 200 species of neotropical migratory birds, and these include um, some birds, like warblers, orioles, um, tanagers, hummingbirds, raptors, and shorebirds. You can see on the map that it's playing on the right, 180 um, species of migratory birds, some of them in the tropical, how they migrate from North America to the tropics. Um, you're probably wondering um, how far do they migrate? How far do they fly? Well, there are species like the Lucy's warbler in, in my neck of the wood here in Tucson, Arizona, that fly just a few um, hundred um, miles or more than um, 1,500 miles every year. Um, the wood thrush, uh, another um, you know, tropical migratory bird, um, travels from the Appalachians on the East Coast to Central and Northern um, South America. So roughly between 600 and almost 4,000 miles every year. So migration is just amazing. It's it's just incredible to um, see all the, those small birds migrating every year. Um, however, as Ruth mentioned, we have been losing a lot of birds. Just in the last 50 years, we lost 28% of our migratory birds. That's 2.5 billion birds in 50 years. To give you an example, we lost two in every five Baltimore Orioles. So it's, it's, it's really sad. And there are a lot of causes, a lot of things causing that. One of the main reasons why we're losing our migratory birds is habitat fragmentation and destruction, both in the breeding grounds in North America and in the wintering grounds in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, in ABC, we do what we call full life cycle conservation. So we do conservation both in the breeding grounds, North America, and in the wintering grounds in the tropics. Um, it's it's complicated thing to do conservation all over the Americas. Um, and ABC developed a conservation initiative called Birdscapes. So these are large landscapes that include protected areas as well as working landscapes. Um, so in the next few slides, I would like you to travel with me to a couple of our birdscapes. The first one will be in Honduras, and then the second one will be in the Dominican Republic in the Caribbean. So the first birdscape I want to present 
is the Agalta Lost City Bloodscape in Honduras. You can see this green polygon on Eastern Honduras. And I'm gonna be focusing on the easternmost edge of the Bloodscape. So I will show you a map. So remember the circle here. So in our Agalta Lost City Bloodscape, we have protected areas. We have national parks, we have biosphere reserves, but also we have different working landscapes. Um, the most common um, land uses are cattle pastures. We have coffee production and cacao production and cacao farms. So look at this picture here, and you can see the people in here for reference, how this really nice cacao farm has what Ruth described as a rustic cacao. So remember the circle I showed you before. So this is um, the edge of the Rio Platano Biosphere Reserve. And you have a river that crosses the Biosphere Reserve. We have mapped close to 200 cacao farms. So all those little dots, I know it's difficult to see, are cacao farms. The only way to access those cacao farms is via a boat. You have to take a boat and travel several hours from the nearest road. Once you get there, you have beautiful cacao farms. You also have some farms that have been degraded. Um, so what we do is we work with those cacao farmers to help them restore their um, cacao farms, to enhance the existing cacao farms by uh, providing uh, training on how to do a right, uh, proper uh, management of the cacao trees, how to do organic fertilizers and pesticides. So we, we, we work with farmers, cacao farmers, and they are farmers, but they are also business people. Their farm is their business and it's their livelihood. So we have to work with them, not just to plant trees. We're also working with them um, in a local company in Honduras to make sure that our farmers have a buyer, right? Because they are producing high quality cacao but who's buying that cacao? So we're supporting a local cacao company who's buying the cacao from the farmers, drying it, and then working with companies like Emily's. So by partnering with Uncommon Cacao, we are making sure that our farmers have um, a good buyer for their cacao. And then Emily will then sell the cacao to chocolate producers. We have, for example, the Castronovo chocolate, and they produce the Lost City Honduras chocolate with cacao from the Mosquitia for, from the um, Agalta Lost City Bredski. Then I want you to come with me to the Dominican Republic, to our septentrional Bredski here in the northern part of the Dominican Republic. We have the island of Hispaniola, we have Haiti on the left, and then the Dominican Republic on the right. So, we're gonna go to the middle of the Britscape, this region here in the circle, and I will show you another map again. But this area also has a protected area, a, a natural private reserve. And then this area is also the most important cacao growing region in the country. You can see here a cacao farm where we are working with one of our partners. And you can see again, the different, different uh, plant layers. You have the cacao and then the trees that, um, that our birds use um, to live and survive. So we have also, here's the area that I, um, in the circle that I mentioned, we also map the cacao farms there. And the reason is we wanna know who are farmers growing cacao and what they are doing and then identify opportunities to help them. We're working with some of them to enhance their cacao plantations. You can see here people planting new cacao um, trees. We're also working with cacao to restore and recover some old cacao farms. You can see the only way to access those areas is with a horse or a donkey. Sometimes we're also restoring areas that look like a golf course. Areas that were previously deforested and then were used for cattle pastures. And now we're trying to recover those areas, both for farmers and for birds. We also help our farmers with um, trainings. We do a lot of capacity building to make sure that they have the best knowledge on how to be productive, how to be profitable, um, and basically stay in the business of cacao farming. 
As with Honduras, we are working with a local company, Sorsal that Ruth mentioned, to make sure that our farmers have a buyer. They are business people. They need to sell their product. So we work with Sorsal Cacao there, who buys and processes the cacao, and then sell it to different companies. Ruth mentioned um, this chocolate from Hummingbird Chocolate. They also said to uh, Mocha Chocolates, they have the Sorsal Cacao um, bar. And as Ruth mentioned, we're working with the Smithsonian to pilot this um, bird friendly cacao certification. We're really happy that we are um, very close to certify the first 25 farms um, in the world as bird friendly. And they are, um, produce 80 tons of bird friendly cacao. So pretty soon we're going to be um, seeing the bird friendly chocolate um, in the shelves. Um, companies like Sorsal Cacao has also offer um, ecotourism opportunities. You can visit the cacao farms, you can visit their facilities and learn more about what good cacao is produced by. Um, I want to leave it there and see if you have any questions. Uh, this is a really exciting topic. And if you have a chance, please consider supporting ABC or projects in Honduras, in the Dominican Republic and through the Americas. Um, I know uh, my colleagues in ABC will share a link with you um, in the chat so you can maybe consider helping us. We have here this um, wood trash desiring you a happy Valentine's and, and I hope you enjoy this talk. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Andres. Um, we're now going to move into the Q&A portion of this webinar, and we got tons of questions, so thank you so much for being such a great engaged audience. However, we won't be able to get through all of them, so just friendly reminder that we're going to have a follow-up email and lots of information on our, our website. We're going to start with some of the questions that came in during registration, and then we'll take some of the questions that came in during the presentations. So first up, our question is, will bird-friendly cacao also connect or address human concerns? Um, there are some things like fair trade, which Ruth mentioned, as well as other certifications that folks can look into. So Ruth, do you wanna follow up and share a little bit more about that social um, and human connection as well as addressing any other popular brands that folks may be aware of? Yeah, thank you for that question. So Smithsonian Bird Friendly as a certification only focuses on the environmental and biodiversity conservation components of chocolate production. Part of the reason we do that is because no other certification is firmly focused on that. There are, as I mentioned, a lot of certifications available for chocolate. Most of them have very strong social requirements. So because we felt like that part of the certification market was um, had a lot of people working on it, we choose to focus on the biodiversity piece, which often gets swept under the rug to focus more on social issues. There are a lot of very important social issues that happen in chocolate supply chains. There are cases of child labor, forced labor, um, and some popular brands do address those specifically. Uh, I think Emily actually can share a little bit more information about that. Uh, but we would love for Smithsonian Bird Friendly to be something that occurs jointly with a certification like fair trade so that the consumer knows that there are social issues being addressed it's something that's equitable and just for the farmers and in addition it conserves biodiversity and no certification can currently make that biodiversity claim emily would you like to join jump in Sure, yeah, I think Ruth um, did a great job covering that. But um, one thing that I would add is that the best thing to do when looking for ethical chocolate um, with a supply chain that you can trust is to find um, your local chocolate maker or brand that you can connect with and really do your own research on where they're buying cacao, how much information they share about their value chain, um, certifications or not. Um, brands that are doing the right thing are typically going to be talking about it and, and giving you evidence of the work they're doing across the value chain. So um, we have a list of uh, chocolate makers on our website, for example, that have um, you know, a lot of information and transparency around the value chain um, that can be found on the partners page uh, on our website organized by uh, geography. 
Thanks, Emily. We're going to shift gears just a little bit in terms of topic and go to ecotourism. So a lot of folks want to visit these farms and support farmers in other ways, which is fantastic. Andres, maybe you can share a little bit more about what that means. And you had mentioned about visiting the farms. Thanks. Absolutely. There are farms, um, both, I guess, cacao and coffee farms that offer um, visits. So you can do some research. I know for, in this case, our partner South Cacao in the Dominican Republic offers that. So if you visit their website, you will see those kind of tours. And I'm pretty sure that Emily and Ruth know other farms that offer those services, which are really exciting to see. Um, Ruth, going back to you, could you expand a little bit on the use of pesticides in cacao farms and especially the, the impact on not just birds, but all wildlife then? Yeah, absolutely. So in the different types of cocoa farms that exist in full sun monoculture, it's almost impossible to farm cocoa in full sun monocultures without using chemical inputs and pesticides. Uh, those types of farming systems tend to have much greater problems with attacks from insect pests and from fungal pests um, than, than a rustic agroforestry system would. So we know that pesticides, many of the pesticides used in cocoa farming countries are pesticides that are banned on WHO lists. They are pesticides that are carcinogenic, have major impacts on insect health and also human health. So because of that, Bird Friendly made the decision to work with organic production um, to guarantee that the farms uh, that we, we source uh, Bird Friendly cocoa from are farms that have a healthy insect population on them and are not actively contributing to, um, to carcinogenic problems uh, with, with the farmers and the workers that work on those farms. So um, it was previously mentioned that wildlife feeds on the actual cacao, cacao pods, pods, that's a tongue trip. Um, and so I just was wondering if, um, Andres, maybe you can share other than birds, are there other wildlife if that we should keep in mind, especially once if we go on ecotourism trips that we should see um, on these farms. Absolutely. Um, so I don't know if this would be feasible for a trip, but I know in fact that um, the cacao farms that we support in Honduras um, are good habitat for jaguars. So if we have jaguars, that means that we have a healthy ecosystem. So it's a big sign that we're doing things right, that farmers are doing the right thing. So it would be complicated to travel to Honduras and visit a cacao farm with gowers, but they're definitely there. So as Ruth mentioned, um, chain, um, in bird friendly, uh, bird friendly cacao farms are not just good for birds, but, but a lot of wildlife. You have the, um, the, the pecaries, you know, that the, the food that, Gower's food. So that's another good sign that farmers are doing the right thing. So Ruth, going back to you, can you tell us a little bit more about the actual certification process? Um, obviously you do research and the data collection, but how does a farmer actually become bird friendly? And is there any cost that farmers need to overcome? Yeah, that's a great question. So now that we have our certification criteria formalized, uh, the work that Migratory Bird Center does is to look for third party companies that are already auditors that already audit USDA organic, and we train those companies to conduct a bird friendly inspection. So we completed a workshop uh, for many auditors in the Dominican Republic that then went out to the farms at Zorzal Cacao and inspected all of those farms, counted the number of shade trees per hectare, counted the number of shade tree species, measured the canopy cover, looked for riparian buffers, looked for soil cover, all of the things that are included in our certification standard. And then it's the responsibility of that company once they've been accredited by the Smithsonian to issue the bird friendly certification. Once a farm has that certification, the certification follows the cocoa from the farm level all the way through to the point of sale. Um, so we require that importers sign an agreement with the Smithsonian saying that they will not mix any of the bird friendly certified cacao beans with other cacao beans or if it's a product that's being imported uh, like bird friendly 
uh, cocoa butter, uh, that will not be mixed with anything else. If it does, it loses that bird friendly certification. So that's sort of the process um, by which the certification operates. On the cost side, there is a cost um, because there are third party auditors that have to go out and inspect the farm and ensure that it, it has its organic certification and that the shade meets the, the Smithsonian standard. So the best model from our perspective is when a chocolate company or an importer really wants bird friendly cocoa uh, and pays for that certification for the farms in their supply chain that they know will meet the standard. We do consider it to be relatively unequitable and unjust for farmers to bear the cost of that certification. Um, it's not always prohibitively expensive. If a cooperative is already providing organic certification for its members, for example, it's a small additional cost to include bird friendly certification. Uh, but the best model is when demand exists on the consumer side that prompts companies to pay for that certification. Thanks, Ruth. So another thing that we're all probably aware of is that climate change is happening and that it has a huge impact on our agricultural practices. So specifically, how is climate change impacting cacao farming? Emily, maybe with the farmers that you work with, you can speak to this. Sure, definitely. Yeah, we've seen increasing impacts every year from climate change, um, but it has been present for a long time in the cacao farming um, industry. So. I would say that one of the biggest factors is that the seasons are changing. So the predictability of rainfall and dry seasons is really shifting, which um, can affect the time that farmers are planting. Um, if, they're, if they have other crops, many cacao farmers are subsistence farmers. They might have corn, beans, or rice crops that they also have to um, be managing. And so if seasonality of those crops changes, then it can also impact their cacao farm. Um, because they only have a certain amount of time that they can spend farming. Um, so I think that's been one major factor has just been the, the shifting and predictability of the weather. Um, we've also seen definitely extended dry seasons or droughts that have led to tree die off. Um, we've seen hurricanes, Ada and Iota, for example, which affected Central America uh, in late 2020, caused about a 40% drop in production of cacao in Guatemala this year. Um, so we're seeing impacts on, on farming on almost all fronts from climate change. Um, it's also creating an impact on the processing of cacao. Um, most cacao is fermented and dried in very rustic environments without electricity, without machines. And so these really critical processes of fermentation and drying are very dependent on the weather, uh, making sure that there's you know, the right weather conditions for fermentation, fermenting masses to maintain their heat and for drying cacao, you know, to be dried at the right pace um, in, in sort of greenhouse style solar dryers. So um, definitely we've seen a number of impacts on both farming and processing because of the changes in weather. Thanks, Emily. So that raises a lot of other questions that folks have also asked about, which is the impact on the actual consumer price. So is climate change, as well as the process and certifications and everything, Ruth, maybe you can jump in as well, actually impacting the cost of um, all of those different steps of production and then the actual chocolate bar that we all buy. So again, just if you could speak to the prices of um, bird-friendly cacao compared to others. Sure. So. Our current model for bird-friendly cacao, because we know that farmers get higher prices when they produce a specialty product, is to start certifying farms that produce very high quality cacao. We are not currently invested in certification of mass market chocolate, um, primarily because most of that is grown in lowland monocultures in the Ivory Coast, in Brazil, in systems that are definitely not bird-friendly or bird-friendly certifiable. Um, so bird-friendly chocolate, all of the Zorzal uh, cocoa bars, um, all, of, all of the specialty chocolate is a little bit more expensive than say a Hershey's chocolate bar. But what you are guaranteed with those specialty chocolates is that farmers are making more for them. They're coming from systems that are protecting birds and other wildlife um, and are generally more, um, more economically and environmentally sustainable. With mass market cocoa, it's typically traded on a commodity price, which is the lowest possible price farmers can make for that product. And in many cases, the cost of production is greater than the, the cost that farmers actually make. So it's really a system that keeps farmers in poverty. So at this moment, we're not um, certifying that type of cocoa production. 
And just a quick follow up on that, um, Uncommon Cacao is the industry pioneer of transparent trade cacao, which means we actually publish all of the pricing and margins across our value chain to address this exact issue. We want to make sure that if you're buying a chocolate bar from one of our partners, or if you're a chocolate maker buying our cacao, you can actually see the entire flow of pricing and money across our value chain to make sure that farmers truly are earning more um, from selling a specialty product. Um, and it's not just sort of a greenwashing um, that's being put on the label. That's amazing. Emily, is there anything else that folks should really pay attention to or know when they're actually buying these products? Yeah, it's a great question and it is a challenge, right? Um, I, there's a lot of reliance on certifications because they tend to be the most easily accessible um, uh, sort of uh, indicator of ethical sourcing for a consumer who's in a supermarket um, and making a quick decision on what chocolate to buy. Um, and they certainly offer a great you know, baseline in many cases for ethical sourcing practices, whether that's environmental practices or social or labor practices. Um, but the best thing you can do is really treat chocolate like the complex food that it is um, with a really interesting and complicated value chain and just really get to know some chocolate brands, chocolate manufacturers, whose products you really like. Um, do some digging into the brands you like, um, maybe research local chocolate makers in your area. Again, we have a list um, by geography on our website of some of the best chocolate makers in the world who have some of the most ethical um, sourcing practices. Um, and in that way, you can really get to know the specific context, where their cacao is coming from, who's producing it, what kind of certifications they offer. Um, so really treating it as sort of like you would wine or uh, maybe a craft beer, like a really specialty product, um, falling in love with brands and really, you know, getting to know their practices um, is the best way to make sure that you're buying a product that is aligned with your values. Great, thank you. Um, so given all of the connections between the habitat, the wildlife, we've talked about social justice issues. Andres, could you also kind of reference a little bit about the effect on political unrest on bird conservation and bird-friendly cacao? I know that's a, a big one. question. Yeah, that's a tough one. It's definitely think, complicated. You know, like we work in really remote areas and sometimes really, they, they really struggle, you know, when, when they can't, the conditions in the countries are not good. That means that buyers are not coming to buy the cacao and then they have issues selling or exporting the cacao to um, buyers that are willing to pay more. So that, that's just one example of how political unrest affect farmers, you know, um, it, 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 it complicates the supply chain. Well, unfortunately, our time is quickly wrapping up and we only have time for one more question. Um, and so while I give a little conclusion, um, I want our speakers to think about what is one thing that you hope people take away from this webinar and share with a friend? So again, everyone, we are recording this. You'll get more information in a follow-up email or on our website. We really appreciate you joining. And Emily, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> Sure, I hope, um, I hope that everyone remembers that chocolate is so much more than just a packaged product that you buy at the supermarket or at the convenience store. Um, there's so much work, hard work that goes into producing cacao. There are so many different environmental factors to be considered. Um, and I think chocolate re represents a really exciting opportunity to get more connected with people around the world who are you know, producing the cacao and, and moving the cacao um, that goes into your chocolate. So. I hope you're inspired to investigate more and learn more about uh, this amazing tree and the fruits and seeds and chocolate that come from it. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'd like everybody just to remember that your chocolate bar can be grown either in a full sun monoculture, that deforested primary rainforest, or it can be grown in a robust, complicated agroforestry system that is home to many migratory birds, many resident birds, and is a great living and working environment for the people that are there. So um, there is mass pressure, economic pressure and pressure from companies to get farmers to reduce the number of trees on their farm. When you as a, uh, as a chocolate consumer 
tell companies that you're interested in buying chocolate that comes from farms with trees still on it, that gives those companies an incentive to help their farmers retain trees instead of pushing farmers to chop down trees. So as a consumer, you really do have a lot of power uh, when it comes to your chocolate purchases. So pick bird friendly. Thanks, Ruth. And Andres? Yeah, well, I wanna, uh, first of all, hope everyone has a happy Valentine's. And then the second one is, um, please consider supporting ABC. We're doing great work. Uh, subscribe to your newsletter. Um, we're always looking for new ways to solve our conservation problems to save our migratory birds. And I'm saying migratory because that's my program, but we're also doing great work to help resident birds and threatened birds. But um, just solving all the conservation problems, you know, like we're helping farmers, but also connecting them with the right buyers, like Emily's company. We're helping farmers get certified through Roots um, Cacao Certification in the Smithsonian. So, Yes, please consider helping and supporting ABC. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to all of our presenters. Thank you to our great audience. With that, we'll now end the webinar. And I hope you all observe some birds and enjoy some chocolate soon. Happy Valentine's Day.